Good evening and welcome to the next generation of on-site sewage treatment uh, conference. On behalf of the planning committee, we hope that you will go away from this conference tonight with some information about alternative sewage treatment systems as well as how individuals and communities are using some of this technology to solve their sewage treatment problems. By treating sewage, what we're really talking about is the recycling of water while protecting the human uh, while protecting human health and the environment. The co-hosts for tonight's conference are from the University of Minnesota Extension Service, Barb Lukanen and Fred Bergsrud. Thanks, Ken. Good evening from St. Paul, Minnesota. We're really pleased that you could join us tonight for our third annual Sewage Satellite Conference. I'm Barb Lukanen from the University of Minnesota Water Resources Center. The conference tonight is being downlinked to about 45 sites here in Minnesota and about 35 sites in 15 other states. So we welcome viewers from across the country. Some of the information tonight may seem more, most appropriate for Minnesota or specific to Minnesota, but most of the examples and the alternatives we'll describe in the research are appropriate across the country. We're going to use a format of some in-studio live panel discussions and some taped segments that will show graphics and examples of the alternative systems to describe them a lot better than we could describe them talking about them here in the studio. Each uh, site coordinator got a packet of information in advance, so hopefully everyone has an agenda. And there are other fact sheets that will provide some additional information about the segments during the evening and some additional background information as well. Uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has decided that the ISTS professionals here in Minnesota can get continuing education credits for attending the conference tonight, two CEUs. And if you want to get that credit, you need to let your site coordinator know coordinator know and the site coordinator has to keep a record to make sure that we have evidence that you attended the conference. Also during the evening you'll be able to call in or fax in your questions and at the end of the night we'll have about a half hour where we'll have some experts here in the studio who will answer those questions. And the number that you can use to call in is 1-800-657-3677 or you can fax in at 1-800-657-3678. Fred. Uh, good evening. I'd uh, add my welcome to that of Ken and Barb uh, to this uh, satellite conference tonight. My name is Fred Bergsrud and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a professor emeritus from the University of Minnesota Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department. Tonight when we talk about on-site septic systems, whether we're talking about traditional systems or alternatives, we're talking about treating wastewater, not simply disposing of it. The purpose of that treatment is to safeguard both our human and environmental health. Now all of the options that will be described uh, this evening require careful evaluation to see if they fit your particular situation. And if they do, then we also have to look at what's the management required to keep them effective uh, over time. Uh, now to discuss some of those issues around treatment and management, here's Dave Gustafson from the uh, University of Minnesota. It's interesting, as we look at systems and ordinances, they kind of boil down to two things, treatment and management. Treatment being how the system works and how it takes care of all the problems, management on how I get to work on the system, the things that I have to do to make sure that system is going to operate or take care of those problems over a long term. Let's look more closely at those two pieces. Treatment, when we say treatment, we're talking about the removal of the problems that we've added to the wastewater. In particular, the problems are the toilet paper or the solids, the other stuff, which is uh, typically measured using BOD, which is biological oxygen demand, the pathogens or the things that make us sick, typically measured using viruses or fecal coliform, and the other nutrients, and the two that we get the most concerned about are nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, how does a system treat or how does a system take care of those different pieces? The solids or the chunks are taken care of typically in the front of the septic tank where settling and separation take out those big pieces. 
There's a lot of people that think, well, then it's done if I've taken care of the toilet paper. But no, the problems in particular, the pathogens and the nutrients are still moving with that water. And so we need that second piece, which is that uh, in most standard systems or conventional systems, the soil treatment area. In the soil treatment area, the soil works as a filter as well as a a magnet or an attractor where it absorbs or it grabs onto the different nutrients and the pathogens as they move through, making sure that we take those out. So the system performance is the treatment or the removal of all those problems. Now, we have a couple choices right now. That is that we've talked about the soil treatment, but we can create other processes that will go through some of that same thing the use of an aerobic tank or the use of a sand filter, which is a soil treatment unit put inside a box, is another method to get at the same treatment. So I have now multiple choices for treatment. I then need to look at the second component, which is what do I need to do to take care of that? Now management is a big term to look at four specific pieces. The management is the daily operation or taking care of the system. Maintenance, which is a physical act that I have to do to take care of it, to make it last the way it's supposed to. In some systems, it may include monitoring. Monitoring would be that I'm checking to make sure that the system is working the way it's supposed to. And then the, the last piece, and this is kind of the negative side of management, is that I need to fix it if it's not working. And the $5 word for that is mitigation. So when I look at management, the, the four categories are operation, maintenance, monitoring, and mitigation. Going back and looking at those a little bit more closely uh, and talking about specific examples is let's revisit a conventional system. In a conventional system, the operation starts with the homeowner or starts with you because how you use water is going to make a significant difference in terms of how the system works. So the daily operation of a conventional system is starting with water use. The maintenance portion then of that conventional system is removing the solids from the tank. That is, at some point in time, and depending on how you operate or use water, you're going to need to pump the solids out of that septic tank. Now, some of you may be saying, but Dave, if I do it all right, I never need to take care of my septic tank. That's not true. All septic tanks will get filled at some point in time, so I need to maintain or I need to remove those solids uh, out of the system. Now, it's interesting that in a septic tank, Maintenance and monitoring can fall into the same category. That is checking to make sure that it's not full would be the monitoring side. Pumping it when it is full would be the maintenance side. But let's take and just change my example just a little. And let's change now that instead of using a septic tank, I'm using an aerobic tank. In that case now, the monitoring is going to be a little bit more in that an aerobic tank needs air to make it work. So the monitoring is going to be to verify or to make sure that the air is being added into the system. Because without the air, it's no longer an aerobic tank, and the design is not the same as a septic tank, so it's not going to work the same. So I've added now some additional components as I made the choice. Now the important thing about adding those isn't that they're there, but that they change how I'm taking care of the system. Or they change how often I need to monitor or look at the system. Or they may change what I need to do to fix it if I'm having problems. So the piece, treatment, which decides which choices are OK for my site, management, what I have to put into the system, are going to be the two pieces that come together that help me make the right choice for where I live to take care of the wastewater for an extended period of time. To restate what David said, he said the purpose of any system is to treat wastewater, but before you make that selection of what treatment system to use, you need to consider what type of management is required. <clears throat> now, there's a publication in your packets uh, that's part of the individual sewage treatment series fact sheets that's called Planning Systems, New Technology, New Management. You may wish to refer to it to get some of the points that Dave made. <clears throat> Now, to further uh, emphasize the management piece of that, here's a clip from our educational video on septic systems. Yes. Cleaning means removing all the solids and sludge from the septic tank. 
Any solids left in the tank could plug your baffle or be forced on the drain field when the tank refills. Pumping, flushing, and back flushing liquids back and forth between the pumping truck and the septic tank will break up solids so they can be cleaned out. Cleaning must be done through the manhole, never through the inspection pipes. It may be easier to get to the tank that way, but it's an impossible way to get a good cleaning and a good way to damage tank baffles. Cleaning through the manhole also allows a thorough inspection of the tank. This is an important part of any cleaning because it can catch serious problems like damaged baffles or roots breaking into the tank. The cost of having a tank pump may be one reason people put it off, but it's relatively inexpensive compared to having a tank replaced or repaired due to improper maintenance. Another reason might be the problem of determining when to clean or how long since the last cleaning. For these people, contracts can be set up where the contractor determines a regular cleaning schedule. I get asked a lot about the commercial additives that are available for septic tanks. There's no such thing as a safe and effective septic system additive. The additives that are safe in the environment probably won't clean the septic tank. They do clean the septic tank, they're not safe in the environment. The fact of the matter is there's no substitute for proper maintenance. As John said, that maintenance, that proper, complete, and regular pumping of your septic tank is important to keep the system working the way it should be, or the way it can. And that is a responsibility as us as homeowners, whether we have an alternative system or a, a standard or traditional septic system. And we're going to use that language a lot tonight, alternative, standard, traditional, performance system. You may use different language in your state than we use here in Minnesota. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're going to have a segment from Mark Westpatal from our Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, who's going to talk about how we classify systems here in Minnesota. And again, there's another fact sheet. This one is called On-Site System Options, and will tell more about how we classify systems here in Minnesota. The 1989 revisions to Minnesota Rules Chapter 7080, which are the state standards governing individual sewage treatment systems, classify systems based on two main criteria. Number one, their known ability to perform, and two, whether or not they use soil for treatment. The key word here is known, as we will discover when talking about each separate classification. The first classification is based on soil-based systems. Soil-based systems are systems which use a three-foot vertical separation distance from the system bottom to the seasonally high water table or bedrock. This three-foot separation is needed for both treatment and disposal. Soil-based systems are classified as standard, alternative, and other. Again, these classifications are based on known reliability with standard systems having the highest degree of known reliability. The degree of reliability is known because of research, both here in Minnesota and other states, field testing, and successful widespread use over a long period of time. The other systems we will speak about may have a high degree of reliability, but not enough evidence has been gathered to prove that. Standard systems include below ground trenches, below ground beds, mounds, and at grade systems. Beds and trenches can be used on well-drained soils which are deep to water table or bedrock. Accrete systems can be used on soils with water tables or bedrock below 36 inches from the ground surface. Mounds can be used where the water table or bedrock is between one and three feet below the ground surface. Sand is added to the soil surface to maintain a three foot separation distance. It should be noted that the size of the soil treatment systems is dependent on the soil texture, whether it be sand or clay, and the water use of the dwelling. Now that we've talked about soil-based systems, let's look at another major grouping, the non-soil-based systems, also known as performance systems. Performance systems can use any method to treat and dispose of sewage, as long as it protects the groundwater and the public health and sewage is not exposed at any time. Performance systems are designed with a pretreatment device followed by some sort of drain field which can be placed closer to the water table or bedrock or it can be made smaller. Options include sand filters, gravel filters, peat filters, constructed wetlands, and aerobic tanks. It should be understood that the use of the different systems is based 
on the local permitting authority. Local permitting authorities are typically counties, with some areas being regulated by cities and townships. The suitable use of new, different technologies should be written into the local septic system ordinance. Local permitting authorities do the choosing about which systems will be used and under what circumstances they will be used. The agency is excited about the future application of these new technologies. As Mark described, we have two types of systems here in Minnesota, the soil-based systems and the non-soil-based. The soil-based systems include both alternative and standard systems, and the non-soil-based systems, which are also known as performance-based, include a pretreatment unit like a sand filter or a peat filter, and then a soil dispersal system as well. And at the end of his, of his segment, Mark mentioned local authorities. And that is local authorities who permit wastewater systems have the ability to decide whether they will accept alternatives or not and which systems they will allow. In the next segment, you'll hear four representatives of county zoning and planning environmental health offices around Minnesota giving their perspective on local decision making and how they apply the rules locally. Because we're far north, we've got a lot of cold soils and a lot of uh, high water tables, a lot of ledge rock or bedrock, um, and conditions that make it really hard to treat wastewater and get it into the ground. And so as a result of that, um, we have many areas that conventional systems don't work well, including uh, we're at a lake, including our lake properties here, or um, properties where houses are, are um, scrunched together for whatever reason. And so we've been forced to look at alternative systems just simply because um, conventional systems don't work real well. Um, there may be an exclusion in the rule that doesn't allow them to put them in or there isn't sufficient space or, or whatever we have. So uh, alternatives here are something that are a necessity. And we've been looking um, hard at, as everybody in the state has been, at different ways to treat wastewater, um, smaller areas, uh, more efficient methods. and. Uh, there's been a lot of interest from the public on doing that. I guess St. Louis County is trying to take the role of being a uh, advocate of change, but doing it cautiously or conservatively. We don't want to see um, runaway uh, technology because there's going to be bad that comes with the good. On the other hand, uh, we, we want to do the best we can in trying to encourage uh, people to try things new and see if we can learn from them what works and what doesn't work. I think it's important, especially especially in our area where the environment plays such an important role of the day-to-day -day lives of our day-to-day -day lives of the citizens of Cass County and the tourists that come to our area. It's so important for our economic base and the well-being of the citizens here, and it's important that the government realizes that they have to be a part of that, part of the solution. Rice County put in their uh, sewage and wastewater treatment ordinance in 1998 a, a provision on performance-based systems and through that we regulate these as far as what is required is an operating permit it, if they have less than three foot separation distance uh, in their, from their dispersal field to the uh, saturated soil. With the operating permit it's, well, it's good for five years and what some of the requirements are is that it has to be uh, monitored. Also, uh, part of this is that they have to have a mitigative plan uh, stating that if what if this whatever pretreatment unit is used, if it's not working, what are the steps they're going to take to mitigate the problem, starting with the least severe to to the most drastic. The uh, the county's ordinance is a little bit restrictive on some of the. Uh, non-standard systems, but I think for a good reason, um, I don't see them being real appropriate for new construction. In other words, our ordinance requires two backup standard systems in order to, to uh, use some form of experimental system. I see them really being appropriate for uh, existing homes and solving problems. Well, as you can see, Bob and I have been joined here in the library by a couple of uh, guests that you've already experienced uh, via tape, but they're here with us live now. The first one is on my far right. That's uh, Craig Gilbertson, and uh, Craig is from uh, Cass County Environmental Services there, and he's also active in the uh, Minnesota Environmental Health Association. 
Sitting, seated next to me is Dave Gustafson, a colleague from the uh, Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department at the University of Minnesota. Craig and Dave are with us to summarize uh, some of the events that uh, we've heard about now up to this point in the conference. So, Dave? Thanks, Fred. I get to kind of introduce or go back to that summary on treatment. And the thing I want to highlight there is that when we look at all the different choices that the use of the term treatment means that all of the systems are going to deal with the problem. So that even though we may have two different routes, as Barb explained, using soil or using another pretreatment device to get there, the final end point is the same, that is treatment. It's just a different route to get there. The other thing too, in terms of Minnesota lingo or, or Minnesota jargon and standard is standard means that we understand that the system gets to that treatment level and what it takes to uh, maintain and take care of that system. Craig? And talking about maintenance, proper management is essential in all types of systems. Uh, it's whether it's the homeowner that periodically goes out and looks at that gravel um, trench, gravity trench, or whether it's a homeowner that hires a professional maintenance company that looks at the more complicated system of, say, drip dispersal or a sand filter. You have to get involved with your system once it's after it's installed. You just can't flush it and forget about it. That's true. And beyond not forgetting about it, the different choices, that is, all the different alternatives don't mean that standard systems aren't a good choice. That the idea of using a conventional septic tank trench in the right conditions can be as effective a treatment mechanism as the more, as the other alternatives. And when you're talking about alternatives, it's important that the local authority is involved because the local authority is going to be approving it, permitting it, and also watching the system to make sure that it's operating for the life of the system. Okay, thanks uh, uh, Dave and Craig. Uh, we've, we've now highlighted, I think, uh, some of the types of systems and have confirmed that the local authority does have uh, the ability to uh, use some non-conventional systems or to control the kinds of systems that are used in their area. So now we're going to describe some different alternative systems and see when it might be appropriate to choose an alternative. Here in Minnesota, of course, we're concerned about proper wastewater treatment across the state. But there are some situations that cause special concern. And tonight, we're going to focus on three of those special situations. First, we're going to look at instances where an individual home has a problem with an on-site system. Next, we're going to look at the special characteristics around our lakes and rivers and shoreland areas. And the third scenario we're going to consider tonight is in small towns where communities are working together to solve their wastewater issues. And in the first set of tapes that you're going to see here, we're going to focus on individual homes who have a problem with a traditional system, either because the water table is high or the lot size is small. Uh, or because there's not enough soil to the bedrock, or some other reason that a traditional system wouldn't work. There is a, um, another handout, and this is this legal sized one, that will tell you more details about the different systems that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, talk about cost, and about flow design, and the kind of system that has been installed. So let's run the footage. We have uh, two homes on our system. Uh, our home uh, has four bedrooms, and the second home has three. So there's a total of seven bedrooms. And uh, we needed a new system, and we have a problem with soil here uh, in that it's a very tight clay. And so uh, we would have had to put in a mound uh, if we were going to go conventional. Uh, and uh, I thought that let's try something different. And we had heard about this aerobic unit. We went to the authorities and uh, was able to convince them to let us put it in. And uh, it's performed uh, um, a little over two years now, uh, flawlessly. It's producing a real good effluent. Uh, from the house, it goes into a 1,200-gallon conventional septic tank. Uh, so far, we haven't pumped that, but I think that we're going to just uh, as a precaution before winter. Uh, from the, the conventional septic tank, it goes into the aerobic unit. 
that is about 1,200 gallons, I believe. And from there it goes into what I call a sump tank. Uh, it's just a holding tank. And uh, uh, when that gets nearly full, the uh, pump automatically uh, kicks on and puts it out into the drip line. The drip line uh, uh, has a manifold on it and six uh, uh, lines, a uh, hundred feet long each one. And uh, it uh, is hooked so that it could uh, recirculate uh, if it didn't get rid of all of it uh, in the first pass. And, uh, you know, everything is underground. I can't tell you whether it does or not but uh, the pump don't run very often, so uh, uh, apparently it's, it's getting rid of it uh, in good shape. We have a, uh, a very good black loam soil here, very rich, uh, runs anywhere from 18 to 24 inches deep uh, on top of solid yellow clay uh, that's nearly impervious, and that yellow clay, because it's so watertight, is uh, what they call mottled. Uh, and so that you can't put a conventional dr uh, drain line in to model soil. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is the system that we have. And uh, we were very concerned about freeze up here, uh, being that it's only 18 inches down. We spent an extra $400 of that 7,000 total uh, for a thermocoupler that w went out in the drain field and give us constant digital readout of temperatures. We also did some, uh, some testing, uh, uh, sent some of the, the effluent to, to uh, uh, a testing lab, and we found out that it was taking out about 60% uh, of the nitrates. Uh, only about uh, uh, 25 or 30% of uh, the phosphorus. But, uh, uh, you know, your, your drain field is capable of, uh, uh, of taking care of that. Uh, the pathogens, of course, uh, I, I'm sure that it don't do anything to the bugs that's in there. From my experience with the watershed district, we saw uh, a vast uh, difference between county officials in looking at new alternative systems. Uh, some were exceedingly afraid of it, and maybe some might have been too lenient. Uh, but uh, I think there should be a happy medium, uh, and I think that, that county officials should be looking at new ways of uh, handling uh, this uh, septage. Uh, as our population grows, and it will, uh, we have to be looking at, uh, at better means. About two years ago, we uh, started to notice a problem where our lawn was getting a discoloration in the grass and uh, we started to notice some seepage uh, near our garden area uh, and so it was about two years ago um, and then it just kind of gradually uh, last summer about a year ago it would be um, got worse uh, well seepage became a little more heavier uh, especially during rainy periods of the year or rainy season type times of the year uh, where the grass would uh, uh, get darker or discolored, uh, and more moisture obviously uh, started to come to the surface, uh, and so we knew something would need to be done. We are installing a, a relatively new system, it's called an aerobic uh, water treatment system. Um, basically what it does, uh, we have an existing septic tank um, that we're going to continue using but uh, we're adding on another tank, which is, follows the first tank, the existing septic tank, um, where the water will be treated more thoroughly with basically air, oxygen. We can use the existing uh, drain field pipe that we have, so we don't have to, dr to dig that up. So there's also advantages of not having to dig up, and there's also there's cost savings there. One thing I think we do need, uh, to do is, is to basically have uh, it tested periodically. Um, and, and I can talk to uh, uh, one of the people that, that has the, uh, works for the aerobic system uh, company, um, that we should have it ch tested about once a quarter. Um, and that'll be the, the biggest change. But other than that, um, no, we should pretty much should be able to uh, keep up with our normal lifestyle and hopefully everything will keep run smoothly uh, and uh, improve. In talking to our Rice County uh, environmental specialist, um, 
we basically need uh, an operator's permit in order for this type of system, I guess, uh, because it is so relatively new. But I think, uh, I guess I say, I think it'll be a, it'll be a good learning process for for us and to be able to monitor and, and check our water and uh, be a good uh, thing for the environment, like I say, hopefully too. Uh, we'll be able to, to test it and make sure that what we're, our septic system is running good and smooth. Um, so I guess we're basically, we're optimistic about what's going to happen hopefully in, down the road here once we get this online. thing to matter with the soils here is the fact that uh, during uh, wet periods of the year, particularly in spring and fall, the water table is within two to two and a half feet of the surface. So the problem here is, is that the current uh, set of trenches that they have installed does not have uh, adequate separation distance between the bottom of the trenches and where that seasonal water table comes into play so that uh, uh, what we're uh, doing here is correcting uh, the problem by adding this sand filter as a component of the system to provide additional treatment before we do a final dispersal into the soil system. In this home, effluent travels from the home into a new septic tank that separates solids from liquids. The liquid moves by gravity into a second tank. A pump on a timer recirculates the liquid between the tank and a sand filter containing layers of pea rock and coarse sand. The, the coarse sand, which actually looks like it may be a gravel as you run it through your uh, fingers, uh, plays the main uh, role in terms of the treatment of the septic tank effluent that we're going to put into it. Uh, that's the area where the uh, bacteria uh, that will reside ultimately in the sand will uh, break down the organic matter and, uh, and provide filtration of the uh, effluent as it recirculates back into the, the uh, recirculating tank and then is taken from there out into the original uh, set of sewage treatment trenches. We ended up having to build a, a custom box because it was going to be above ground. Uh, it needed to be strong enough then to hold the four feet of material that's going to be inside it. We we're going to put a plastic liner inside of it to hold the sewage or the, the treated wastewater uh, inside it. It's going to increase the value of the property and uh, it sounds like it's a very simple system so hopefully uh, there shouldn't be any uh, a lot of upkeep. The, the solid waste uh, uh, unit is, is just what I said, solid waste. Anything that's, that is either human product or comes from a garbage disposal uh, is, all, is all going into the one composting unit. Uh, when we run the garbage disposal, there's a fair amount of water that is used to spray down and, and help uh, clean out your lines. So there is a fair amount of water plus any urine that goes in there. Well, that system has the composting unit has a small sump pump in there and that allows for any urine or water that is produced in that tank to settle down through the compost it, it finds its way out the bottom of the tank and then it's is therefore pumped and that gets pumped over into what we call the gray water unit and the uh, gray water unit takes anything from the showers the kitchen sinks the dishwasher the laundry uh, laundry uh, uh, facilities all gets pumped into the gray water tank. One of the questions that we get often get asked is is there is there odor, is there a smell in the house, is there you know do you have bugs in the house, do the worms get out, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the worms that we have in the tank are, are considered Texas uh, wigglers or Texas red worms and uh, no they don't escape the tank system actually at times you can see them in there it's a highlight of the kids when they get a chance to see the worms inside the tank um, twice a year I, I have to go through and, and pump off the the sludge or the settlements off the the gray water tank and that's uh, that's usually done in the uh, same time that I, I I do the cleaning of the compost tank or taking the compost out and then somewhere during the six months later I would take out and, and pump off. 
On a month-by-month -month basis, we have a, uh, usually a, a filtering screen within our gray water tank that I, I need to uh, uh, take out and clean it out, wash down the, the inside of the, the gray water tank, just kind of clean it up, uh, make sure everything is, is working fine in there. Actually, it has its advantages. I can pour grease right down the toilet from your frying pan. Throw, we can throw Kleenexes, and, well, of course, Kleenexes, but your paper toweling, any paper products go, de go down there. Anything biodegradable can go in the system. Generally, they want it to go through the disposal first, so it gets ground up, but it makes it so convenient. Well, welcome back, and I get to introduce uh, our new guest, Barb McCarthy, from the University of Minnesota Natural Research Resources Research Institute up in Duluth. Welcome, Barb. It was interesting, as I looked at those four different alternatives, or four different sites, it was interesting that they ended up with four different choices because of the problems that they got to deal with. The first site, they got to deal with a uh, high water table and heavy soils, so the site helped them to move towards a solution. The, the second site also, again, was a high water table situation. And the last site was just trying some new ideas along with some bedrocks as, bedrock as a problem. But the sites gave kind of the, the, what they needed to work with to end up then choosing a technology to make sure that they got treatment. Right, and that's, I think, common across the board with each of the systems here is that they do com uh, provide a comparable level, level of treatment as a standard system does. Um, also important uh, as part of the, um, this piece is that uh, several of the system, several of the sites have used technologies that where they can use pretreatment systems to actually retrofit where they can use the existing uh, soil dispersal part. So that's a, a good uh, use of the technology as well. And tying in then that, that uh, retrofit is also the need for management. It was interesting, Jack's comment there at the end that it's a simple system, and I think that simple is, is a good term for that choice, but it still needs to be managed. That is, the recirculating filter is going to need to be operated and made sure that the performance is doing what it needs to so that the treatment takes place at the site. Other options had different levels of management that they would need, from a semi-annual visit a, on an aerobic tank to the homeowner with the separation technology talking about a monthly activity that they needed to do uh, on their system to make sure it was operating and uh, working the way it's supposed to. And working the way it's supposed to meant that um, it was going to uh, have a long-term uh, operation on that site. And I think lastly, across all of the projects, education is key, a critical component. I think everybody learned a lot um, from the homeowner trying to make the, the, the choice of which system to use to the uh, county uh, who have to permit the system. And then eventually the homeowner has to understand how the system is used and how to take care of it across the board. So, Great. Thanks, Dave and Barb. Again, just a reminder, if you have a call, a question that you'd like to have us answer at the end of the night, you can call in or fax in that question. And the numbers for that are 1-800-657-3677 for phone or 1-800-657-3678 for the fax. We're going to look at another scenario here, another special situation. In Minnesota, we have a lot of lakes and rivers, and there are some special issues or special problems around the, in those shoreland areas. The water table is high. A lot of times the lots are very small, and the developments are older. And also those houses or cabins may get real intensive use during some seasons or just on weekends, and that can put a real load or stress on a traditional system. There are a lot of different alternatives for people living in shoreland areas. Uh, and again, any one of those alternatives is re going to require some management, some maintenance. And what that management is will depend on the site characteristics and the interests of the owner. Uh, a collection system might be the best solution in a shoreland area, but it's not the only solution. Individual systems will work as well. Now we're going to look at some tape from four different lake areas in Minnesota, and you'll see the different solutions that they've chosen for those problems.
<laughs> well, before we had this in, of course, we all had our individual pumping systems, and uh, we all had an individual sewer system. And it was uh, the sewer systems, many of them around had become not uh, complying to the uh, state laws because there was uh, some of that, uh, the drain fields were too close to lake, and, uh, and some of them even had pipes that were running into the lake for the drain fields. And uh, so it was, uh, wasn't was for a very good uh, setup for the lake. We had a, in the motel there at, uh, on a uh, busy weekend. The motel would have many customers in it, and they had a little septic tank, which was not legal at all, which was uh, out lead, and it would overflow, and uh, the water would be underneath the our clothesline here, and uh, on the Monday morning, your wife would be hanging the laundry up and uh, having to have boots on to <laughs> get out underneath them. Uh, Craig uh, Gilbertson of the environmental system, he uh, could see what was going on, and they knew what was going on, and so uh, they worked on trying to get, get this done to protect the lake. The restaurant and the motel on Shingaby Island at that time in the early 90s, 93 or 94, changed hands. So we were concerned about the septic system at that time and knew it somewhat suspicious that it was a quote unquote bad system. We'd heard horror stories but hadn't proved it yet. So we required the new owners, which was uh, the Leech Lake tribe, to put in a new septic system uh, before they started operation. And as you've seen, the island is very difficult to put in a, a standard type of system. So we realized at that time that we were going to have to look at something different. And the only available property for the treatment area was across the highway, and that was owned by the state of Minnesota. So the state of Minnesota was not going to let um, just the reservation and the motel and restaurant use that particular piece of property unless the entire island, which is uh, an additional 14 houses and another business, use that piece of property. So the county board allowed me to work with the citizens out here, work with the uh, Leech Lake tribe, and with the state of Minnesota to look for a solution. The system consists of 14 residential homes and two businesses. Uh, one of the homes is a six unit complex. Each of the individual homes have their own septic tank. Uh, such things as the restaurant might have two or three septic tanks. Then they all go out into a main in the road uh, where the effluent goes to a uh, singular lift station, about a 9,000 gallon lift station on this side of the highway. Then it's pumped across Highway 371 uh, to a wayside rest. And in the middle of the wayside rest, the uh, state of Minnesota has allowed us to uh, obtain a, a piece of property. It goes into a settling septic tank there. Then it is dispersed through drop boxes into gravelous trench. Sewage effluent has been uh, monitored. We had residential BODs um, in the mid 100s uh, parts per million. Um, the effluent in the settling tank, just from a visual standpoint, is very clear. I look at the drain field a couple times a year, see where it is uh, as, as the course of the drop boxes and how it's going through the field. Um, the daily monitoring of flows is done by uh, Bob King, residents there that has just uh, done a great job and is an integral part of the system. Uh, it's just more of a visual checks now to make sure it's operating right. When they first came out with the uh, projected costs of operation, it was figured that somebody <coughs> should check the, the readings on the water meter once a day and, uh, and also on the uh, sewer, uh, the pumpage down there, and uh, it was projected to be a certain cost for that, to have somebody do that. So I, uh, I was concerned about the financial situation of the place. If we'd have the money uh, coming in, it would be enough to pay for our expenses or any future expenses that might arise. So I uh, thought, well, I'll volunteer to do that. Well, for a long time, I went down every day and took the readings and checked and see if there was any uh, uh, excessive use of water which at first, I didn't know first what would be excessive use, but we didn't know just how much it would be used. But uh, it uh, finally settled down, so you knew just about what would be a normal usage. And uh, 
then uh, whenever it was come out to be extreme you see really then I know something was something was wrong there was a frozen pipe or leaking or else a, like a flush valve on the uh, uh, toilet or basin would be sticking or something like that I think really it uh, it's important to, to me the fact that it made it so much easier but also uh, the overall picture of it that it's done so much for the lake by not having this sewage pumped in there which has caused problems so in many places around the country and with a lot of houses around the lake. When the uh, flooding came to the lake system here, that the there was no question all the or the majority of the uh, septic systems went underwater. Uh, and of course, affluents were then mixing with the lake levels and there was a real problem. Well, I think the biggest problem that we had, of course, never did happen, but there were people that not only were worried about the cost of the system, but were worried about it wouldn't last and wouldn't work. And, and uh, there was great concerns there. Uh, it was new or it was newly engineered or however we'd want to say that and there was this you know concern with people uh system was put in, in on big marine lake and on the east bay which is off to our left and right here on the west side and it was on the highland they acquired land up on in in two farms and they put in large uh, holding, redid all of the the uh, uh, soil work that was in the area, and built it according to the specifications, and uh, uh, then put in all of these uh, duck air duct systems for drying it off and drying and getting rid of the moisture. And our treatment treatment system is owned by Washington County. It's managed by Washington County and New Scandia. Uh, for the area that's in New Scandia. Then I believe May Township is involved for the area in Big Carn, you know, Bar Big Carnean, because it's in their area. And it's simple. I mean, if, you, if that lighter buzzer goes on out in your backyard, you just pick up the phone and call a number, and within an hour, somebody will be here, shut the the light off and shut the buzzer off if you happen to have a buzzer in your area and they'll have that thing back and running no time no time flat and that service is just great and that's a biggest one of the big concerns we had was will we be forgotten will this thing really go but that isn't true it really has been done well uh, you know the concern of whether there's you know been any change because of the system that we install that really is not a problem at all uh, I think the the ladies and the children and the guys enjoy the idea of being able to have showers and bathtubs and and flush toilets and no problems to this at all landowners along the lake here are all located in a very narrow corridor and there's not much room between the highway and the lake and we're concerned about clear water uh, uh, water that is environmentally sound and of course the overall condition of the lake so one of the things we've done is uh, we've kind of searched around uh, how to improve our sewer systems and uh, we were interested, first of all, in just upgrading our own systems, and the county said, no, there might be some better ways. So that's what we started pursuing, and we started back in uh, actually 94, so that's five years ago, and it's been a slow step-by-step -step process, and I think the most, most important part of that process has been finding our way without a lot of assistance until about two years ago when the county said that we could use Craig Gilbertson. The system on North Ten Mile Lake is a cluster system. Each individual property will have at least one step system, which will consist of a septic tank, 
a pump chamber with a pump and a uh, tank filter in there and they'll be capable of pumping the effluent up to the treatment area. As Jerry mentioned, it's approximately half a mile away. Each homeowner's pump is capable of bringing it that far. Um, the homeowners, from the homeowner's septic tank, it'll go underneath the county road, then it'll hook up with a main, a pressure main, and be brought up to the treatment area into a septic tank there, where the final treatment will be on uh, county property, and it'll be uh, drip dispersal uh, throughout a one and a half acre area in the middle of the woods. Just to add to that a little bit, the force main is supposed to be some new kind of a pipe that will not freeze at three feet. And uh, the, the uh, landowners here are, still have a little trepidation about that in northern Minnesota. Oh, it doesn't get that but, close. Uh, yeah. So we uh, requested the engineer to add in a uh, heat tape. It's been a, a real, again, a cooperative effort with homeowners, county, township, um, Shingabee Township and uh, Shingabee Township clerk Paul, Paul Fairbanks have been um, extremely uh, vital to the project and have worked well with us and, and done a good job. We're all learning uh, how to approach and, uh, and uh, come to uh, a final solution, uh, which for us was not just uh, merely sitting down and saying, okay, do this. It's our system. And uh, we've been advised that uh, we're the ones that are going to be responsible for it when it gets in. The project started because my septic system failed. Um, it was just a steel, hole, steel tank that went into a wet well. And uh, we went down to the county to get a permit. They came up and they did some uh, borehole testing and stuff. And they test for perk. And also, at that time, they decided that um, the bottom of your septic system, the mound has got to be three feet above high water mark. We had like a foot. So it had to build it up. But they said also the, um, it's a gravelly soil. so. Um, it would drain through too fast, so at that point they failed us on our septic. So we were at that time went in a holding tank, and we were um, debating about going with the communal mound system being everybody on the road is in the same boat, and there was four of us at that time that were looking to do something. So we were looking into putting a communal mound out where our um, experimental wetlands is, and then Jeff Crosby came up and said that the state was actually looking for some experimental projects for alternative treatments and that's when they came up with the experimental wetlands. Right here where we're at is uh, an area called Grand Lake. It's uh, north of Duluth and we have a very high water table. It's, a, it's a traditionally a cabin area. It's very typical of lake areas and uh, this is an area where we can't use conventional systems. We've actually used mounds and uh, we had one of them sink of all things because of uh, the organic soils and yet that was state-of-the-art technology at the time the individual wanted to put something in. And in this particular case, we used, uh, actually with the cooperation of a, a group of homeowners, we put together a uh, project where we collected the wastewater and put it into a, um, a constructed wetland. And that has worked very well. Um, it, it's a, both an example of how to do a collector system, and it's also an example of uh, how to treat wastewater with an alternative technology. One of the things that we think we did do in this case is we solved a real problem, is we got wastewater out of, the, out of the lake, which is essentially where it was going with minimal treatment, and no matter what type of system you had, it wasn't treating wastewater very well. We got it out of the lake and we put it into a area that's about 700 feet away from the lake and we think we, we did a better job of treating it. The wetlands there also has the ability to um, further polish or assimilate wastewater as it leaves that, so if you look at the whole environmental approach, we're, we're at background levels. for. for we have, as a group, have pretty much been, we've had mount systems and stuff. Um, we're a pretty conservative group as far as water usage. I think um, as far as the nine houses involved, we use less than 100 gallons a day, which is not typical of a normal house. So we are on the low side for water usage, but I guess being on a mound, people generally are. So most of us have low flow water, uh, low flow toilets and low flow shower heads and faucets and stuff. So we do wa watch our water usage that way. And being it is a normal septic tank, we're just pumping the effluent out of the tank. We still have to um, pump our septic tanks every three or four years to get rid of um, the solids out of the tanks. And then we also, in addition, have a filter coming off of our holding tank into the pump chamber. 
so that we do not take in a lot of solids out into the wetlands. The things to look for in a septic is, is um, unconventional systems maybe are a better solution to the problem. Like ours, we actually looked at maybe a communal mound system, which for other people might be a, a good idea, um, a worthwhile situation. That's what we're going to start off with. And it was a viable and it wasn't that much more expensive. We were going to group a, a bunch of us together and then we were going to pump it that much further away from our property and then you wouldn't have the mound on there. So there is actually alternatives out there that you can use. I know now they have drip irrigation systems and there is alternatives out there that actually do as good, of, if not sometimes a better way of treating the wastewater. And if you get enough people together, any system is work because I think even if we had to pay for this whole system ourselves, it still would have been cheaper than if everybody would have put a mount system in by themselves. Well, welcome back and thanks for those uh, good discussions and those different choices. I'd just like to remind you that we're looking for your thoughts and comments and questions and so if you want to fax or mail those in, that would be, uh, or call those in, that would be great. <laughs> As I looked at those different options, it became clear to me that, that com, uh, community systems was one choice, but also individual choices would still work on lakeshore properties. We don't want you to walk away thinking that lakeshore means that I have to go uh, to a different site, but it is important to make sure that the site you're working with is going to work for the technologies that you're looking at. Also, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that you understood was mounds are a real and good long-term choice. Even though in some of the sites that we looked at, mounds didn't fit or because of soil types uh, at the site weren't the best choice, in a lot of places, mounds, if built and constructed properly, can be a real choice for treating wastewater. Barb? Yeah, and in each of these situations, uh, really, we, the uh we really need to take a close look at the soil and site evaluation process really to determine um, if you go with an individual system or if you have to go off-site to a, um, a community type system. And in each of the four projects, really four different kinds of alternative systems were, were selected um, largely because of site limitations. There wasn't enough room uh, on the individual lots for an individual system because of uh, uh, distance to a lake, uh, well setbacks, and so forth. Um, each of the projects I don't think would have happened without a uh, close partnership with the local units of government. Uh, people like uh, Craig Gilbertson and Jeff Crosby really helped develop the project and work with homeowners to see it through, um, through completion. So cooperation is very important in each of these types of projects. And it's interesting in terms of those kind of partnerships, how it fits together. Not only is it partnerships in terms of the local unit of government and the homeowners, but the home, homeowners themselves as they get together to, to solve their uh, wastewater problems. Along with those partnerships though, Bob highlighted that fear can paralyze a project. And I think that fear can come in a couple of ways. One of them that he talked about in terms of the worried about does it work or not. The other fear that Jerry mentioned was the concern about freezing. And, and to me that brought up a point where the people involved in the project are going to have concerns or are going to have issues that need to be dealt with and they need to be dealt with up front and they need to be dealt with honestly and work through it. In that case they did a little extra in terms of the design and uh, to deal with that uh, freezing issue or the, the issue of being cold. The last thing that, that they highlighted and I think it's critical is that Jerry said that it's going to be the homeowner's responsibility. That they're going to be responsible for taking care of the system. They're going to be responsible for making sure that it does operate the way it's supposed to. That in the end, they are responsible for their system and making it operate and treat the way it's supposed to. So from that perspective, it's certainly important that the owner believes in the system they've got. Uh, if they don't, why well, they're certainly not going to get there. Well, thanks, uh, Dave and Barb, for that summary of of the second of the three scenarios that my co-host Barb Lukanen laid out uh, that this segment is dealing with. The third uh, scenario focuses on small towns and how the people in those uh, communities can work together to come up uh, with a solution to their wastewater problems. Again, collection systems may be the preferred solution, but it's certainly not the only solution. In these uh, two examples that you'll see, 
The communities have made choices that fit their specific situations. In the first example, the community of Hillman uh, chose to install individual mound systems, uh, which we would call then a standard solution. In Spring Hill, they selected a performance solution. So as we look at that, just let me remind you that you saw this handout earlier, but don't forget to refer to this handout for more details on any of these examples that uh, we illustrate in these scenarios. I believe at that time uh, the previous mayor, uh, Carmen Starr, came to uh, the assistant zoning administrator, the water plan coordinator, uh, and uh, questioned the possibility of, of doing a mound, uh, doing the grant in, in the city of Hillman. They uh, met several times with citizens from the uh, village of Hillman. Uh, they pre had a public hearing at the city. They had to. They needed to do some uh, contacts in the, in the, uh, of all the people in the city, and, and uh, I believe it started from that point and, and worked forward. Uh, Mark did most of the legwork. He did most of the grant writing to assist the citizens of, or the city officials, I should say, to put all the paperwork in place, make all the contacts with the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control people, and submitted the grant in behalf of the city council. Mark did a very good job. I uh, went to a couple of the meetings and um, he explained everything because yes, the citizens of Hillman are, there's plenty of us that are older than I am, but I mean, they're older. <laughs> but um, they needed reassurance that what we were going to do was going to be the right thing and the mound system is a right thing to do in the city. I, I think to follow up on that a little bit, Ken, uh, there's always a little bit of skepticism or has been a little bit of skepticism about the efficacy of, of the mound system. There's still some uh, thought that the mound system does not work. Uh, and, and I think this was a reassuring, uh, the fact that the city of Lastra put, uh, put in 47 mounds, uh, they had the opportunity to communicate with any of those individuals who had systems installed, actually could go out and view their, their situation and see how it all fit in. And, and, and I think they were uh, satisfied with, with that particular project. They were satisfied with, project. The, yeah, with the project. Some people in the city of Hillman didn't have enough room just to put in their mound system. They needed to drill a new well because the wells that we, some of us had were just dug, dug, wells. dug wells. And so in order for us to get the mound systems, we had to have drilled wells and you have to be a certain percentage of feet away from your mound system to your well. Environmental issue is a real big part of it because a lot of our, our city is a recycle. We are a recycle city. We have, um, where everybody is worried about what's going to happen for their children later on. It is a good property value on the homes. Um, if I were to have to go out and solicit getting a mound system in or any kind of sewage type of a system for your home to upgrade it to help the environment, I hope that somewhere along the way that all people will put them in. A good piece of advice for the uh, citizens of a community such as Hillman here is to have the city officials uh, bring all the citizens together in a community meeting, uh, explain uh, very accurately, very thoroughly the advantages of uh, the program that if they wish to go into the grant program, some of the advantages uh, that are going to, ha could happen to their property, uh, the increased uh, uh, property, property value. value situation. I would like to, um send out some advice to uh, area cities if they are in a situation of a uh, Hillman had where they were pumping their sewers and not knowing where it was ending up or what was happening to it in the upcoming years. I would um, tell them to go to their area um, government center and go to see who could start them off or keep going. You have, to, you have to keep following through with what you start with in order to make sure you can find out what you want.
Spring Hill is mainly a farming community. We have like 72 uh, people that live in the community. It's um, made up of 40 units. Um, it is a dairy uh, area. There's a lot of farming. It's a farming community. Um, in our town, we have two, two bars, a store, and a garage. That's the businesses in our small community. It started off, the county came in and they were gonna redo the road. And the county had asked about the sewage or our sewer system in our town. And uh, they found out that it was not in compliance and they found out it ran to a creek in our area. The sewage water went to the creek. So in 1997 is when I took office as, as a city mayor and we worked right away with the county and the Minnesota Pollution Control and the state and the federal government and to see what we could do to get some funding to help us to start our project. I think the first one was the GEM project which stands for Greenwald El Rosa Meyer Grove. They have a lagoon system and it's, a, it's located maybe eight miles from our city. And we thought, you know, instead of doing something else, we could just hook up with them. But that was very costly. So that was, and they didn't have the room for us too. So that was, you know, they would have to expand their lagoon system in order for us to work. Then we thought of aerobic, there's an aerobic system but that was very high maintenance, so we didn't care for that. Then there were, was the mounds. Um, that, our lots are all pretty narrow and small, so that didn't seem real feasible neither for our area. So another object was the wetland, another alternative for us. Why we like the wetland is because there will be no standing water and it'll look more like nature because wildflowers will be planted and we'll plant trees along um, the site. The county of Stearns County um, has been very helpful um, through this whole project from day one. They have come to meetings. They've done, um, they've been at the site with working. Um, they've answered questions throughout the community. Um, they've helped us. Um, every day Karen has been here uh, as far as what the, once the wetland started and seeing what they were doing, she has uh, made sure that all the specifications have been met. If they were unsure, she got the, the pamphlet out and made sure that they seen what, what was to be done. So Karen has really been our eyes for us um, the city of Spring Hill is installing um, two 6,000 gallon septic tanks uh, with uh, two uh, wetland cells for the constructed wetland cell treatment and then it will be disposed of in five different zones for drip irrigation. Um, the county is going to be involved with the system on an ongoing basis. First of all, since we are the permitting authority, um, there will be annual reports submitted and um, the permit will be renewed every five years through the county. The operation and maintenance of the system basically is going to involve um, checking the sludge in the septic tanks to uh, determine when and, and how often they'll, they'll be need to be pumped. Second of all, there'll be a flow meter and so they'll be need to be measuring the flows to ensure that they're staying under that 10,000 gallons per day. Um, there'll be um, a number of pumps that do in the dosing tank that they'll just have to kind of watch to make sure that they're, they're performing okay and then to do any uh, visual inspections, making sure that we don't have any you know, surface discharge, um, that the wetlands aren't um, ponding, because obviously there's not gonna be any surface water, it'll all be subsurface. And from there, basically, um, it, they should be on their own. The best advice I could give other, another county um, that would be undertaking this type of project would be first to be involved with the community from the very beginning. Um, to encourage that community to make sure that it is uh, a community decision and that everybody is up to key as to uh, what's going on with the project. Um, then to educate yourself, you know, and, and to really just stay involved with it from the very beginning to the very end because I found it very 
um, educational. You know, learned a lot through this project. And then to also not forget about it, you know, to follow up afterwards and be able to uh, make some determinations on future projects based on past experience. So in this segment, really taking a look at some of the options for small community systems in both the, uh, the Hillman and the Spring Hill uh, projects, we really took a look at their options, uh, did a close evaluation to determine wh which type of system could be used. Uh, with Hillman, uh, basically it was the individual mounds that were the uh, most cost effective and best uh, type of system because they had room um, on their individual lots. Uh, versus Spring Hill where uh, they looked at options but their lots were small and basically chose a, a wetland drip system. It was also interesting in terms of both of those options or both of those projects how they started out. In the case of Hillman, it started out because the city identified a problem and then they went to get some assistance or some help uh, from their local unit of government. On the other side, the local unit of government came in and asked some questions and then through an educational process, they ended up saying as a community that we need to move forward. But in both cases, the community kept the ball rolling and I think that's, a, that's an important point that without someone pushing, in particular, without local people keeping the ball rolling, things are not going to happen the way they're supposed to. The other thing that, that both groups identified as critical was communication. I liked in the, in the uh, city of Hillman how the communication was with each other, but also that they went to other communities that had already been successful. And with that extra step or with that information gathering done, being done, they could come back and, and say that this is the way that they as a community could go forward. The communication also uh, went back and forth uh, with the regulators and I appreciated the uh, local regulators comments that how important education was uh, in the process. And I think the, uh, the last point that I'd like to make is something that Karen said. It's uh, basically, you know, don't forget about the system. And I think that's true with both of the projects here, either with the individual standard system or the community type of system. We, we, they do have to pay attention to it. It does have to be operated and maintained. And that uh, follow-up is needed uh, for both of them. And that's something that the state of Minnesota is doing through the research pro uh, program that was established here uh, several years ago where we're trying to evaluate the use of some of these systems in our cold climates and then to get that information out to the, the general public. Just like you're not supposed to forget about the system, we don't want to forget about you. So could you please uh, fax and phone in your comments, and those of you that are trying to mail the zip code here is 55155, <laughs> just teasing. But we're also going to take just a short break now to uh, give us time to put those together and to uh, maybe come back with some uh, different ideas or new thoughts. So we'll be see you in just a couple minutes.
break. Uh, we're n what we've just finished doing, I just remind you that we just got through the three scenarios <clears throat> and that these situations were real people solving some real problems that they had out there. That's right, Fred. They looked at their conditions and picked the system that was right for them, whether it was individual systems or collection systems, alternative or standard traditional systems. They considered the site conditions, the cost, what management would be required, um, and also their desire to protect the environment as they made the choices that fit their situation. Well, and so that raises the possibility that now we could start to develop some areas that weren't considered suitable for on-site treatment systems before. Mm -hmm. uh, if we start to do that, is that good? Uh, no, not really. Land use development should not be solely based on placement of on-site septic systems. Um, it should be more of a component of land use development on-site placement. Uh, specifically, you can't downsize lots just because of the type of sewer system that you're putting in. If you do some of those things, you could create more problems, so you want to watch that. And another problem that you could create is some of these new systems need new levels of management. What I mean by that is, up to this point in Minnesota, our standard systems have used the soil as a treatment mechanism. And, this, and choosing the soil meant that I was choosing a system that we felt very confident in terms of its treatment. Now if I'm going to go to a different system, I'm going to need to monitor to make sure that that treatment is taking place. It isn't a change that the treatment is there in a standard system, it's just now I'm verifying it uh, in the performance system because of some of the tools I'm using. Now this new management requirement means that I'm going to need a new level of oversight or, or some type of uh, management entity that's taking care of it. In the videos, we saw a couple different ones, like a city or an individual in the case of the separation technology. Or the, the final thing would be some of the, the homeowner groups that have gotten together in terms of that management. The caution that I would say is that without the management entity in place, go slow with the new technologies because the management is going to be critical to making them work. Otherwise, you're going to end up with lots of problems where these new technologies aren't working the way they're supposed to. In addition to that, I'd like to add that it's essential in this management <coughs> that a partnership develops. As we talk about partnerships, uh, there should be a partnership with the local agencies, with the homeowners, and the state agencies. Um, it's essential that these management uh, partnerships develop if you want to make sure that the systems are working. Uh, the local agencies can provide the options for the homeowners, and the state agencies can help also provide additional education and technical advice uh, to the management. One of the other partnerships uh, that people are interested in is the costs. And uh, that might be a place where a partnership can develop in terms of cost, uh, working out how it gets paid. When we look at costs, I, I do want to highlight that in your handout packet is a um, guide that we put together to look and talk a little about costs, but more importantly than the dollar amounts is some of the issues that are related to costs. That is, that cost includes, if I don't have a good system, that is, if I don't treat the wastewater, my impacts or, or my environmental or even uh, public health issues have a cost associated with it. So treatment can be less expensive because I avoid problems down the road. The other cost that people think about is what it's going to cost out of my pocket. And um, that's an important piece, it, for at least for all us Scandinavians. And the part there, though, is that the capital cost and the management cost needs to be included. That in some of these systems, the capital cost may be very small, but the management cost may be very big. I guess the example that comes to mind is a holding tank that that is a low capital cost, but to take care of it, to pump and haul, could be an extreme expense. And over the life of that system, that could be the, the big part of the cost. Cost is one of the pieces in terms of the decision, but there's other criteria that goes in there as well. And those are kind of laid out in that sheet, talking about appearance, uh, landscaping opportunities, homeowner acceptance. All of those are going to be issues that fall into this decision-making matrix that's going to make the choices uh, what they are. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I guess if I were to paraphrase what I heard you say, it's something about don't make bad land use decisions just because we now can use alternatives. And we have to look at a whole package in order to make that kind of a decision. 
Well, that kind of puts a wrap at, on the second part of this session. Uh, and so now we're into, we've been receiving questions uh, all evening, and we're ready to start the process of answering them. So we've got all of our experts out here, here with Barb and I in the uh, library portion of this are Craig Gilbertson and Dave uh, Gustafson, I'd remind you again. And over at the news desk, we've got uh, Barb McCarthy and Mark Westbethall. Uh, and they'll all be responding to questions. So, Barb, why don't you uh, fire off with the first question? Great. We've got a couple questions here about filters, one from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and one from Peace County, and I'm not sure what state that's in. But um, how important are effluent filters, and what are the advantages of those? And could you talk a little bit more about filters and tanks or what other filters exist? Dave, do you want to talk about filters? And first off, what is an effluent filter, or the term that we're using is screen, because that's kind of its function. It's a device put in at the outlet end of the septic tank that will screen the water before it goes out of the septic tank. The goal of those is to keep the solids, or the chunks, which is the function of the septic tank, in the, in the septic tank. The advantage is just that, that it removes the solids, it keeps them in there, but also the advantage, at least uh, in my mind, is that it forces maintenance. That is that it helps mm -hmm. us to remember to go out and, and take care of that, or, or it, it makes it happen. Now. Maintenance in those cases are cleaning the screen and then pumping the tank. That's kind of a, a two-step piece. I also like to remind people that use those here in Minnesota that it's a good idea to have an alarm when they put the screen because if I don't take care of it and I have backups at our house, an alarm goes off named Nancy. And Nancy is extremely expensive to reset. So it's important that you know about that before. But that's where ma that management piece, that is the alarm then, is a piece of my uh, management system. Are they worthwhile? My answer is anything that helps to protect the downstream things is going to be a, it has a positive uh, effect on the system. And I'd just like to add to that, they're very cost effective. As Dave talked earlier about costs, a filter in the tank is relatively inexpensive, less than $100, generally speaking. Okay. Uh, for the next question, uh, Barb McCarthy, I'm going to throw this one at you. Uh, wetland systems, what determines when they are lined or unlined? And this one comes from Chisago County here in Minnesota. Um, well, I've been involved in a number of wetland treatment systems, and uh, pretty much all the, all the systems, the wetlands that we've been involved with our research site and some of the demonstration uh, projects in the northern part of the state, they've all been lined wetland systems. So uh, typically you use a, you know, an impermeable liner to line it and put your rock in and put your plants in and um, so forth. Uh, what you do with the water, that's uh, another um, question as far as the dispersal. You can go into a, uh, an at-grade system, you could go to a trench system, you could go to a drip system as we've seen in some of the tapes. So typically the wetland cell is, is a line type of uh, system. Well, let me come back with a, uh, another uh, wetland related uh, uh, question. And this one, Dave, I'll throw at you. Are specific soaps and detergents bad for wetlands? And this one comes from Duluth. Well. I think in terms of a wetland system, because you're growing the plants, any kind of a toxic material would be bad. I don't necessarily see that any of the soaps are toxic, other than the soaps that have bleach as an additive may be something that you would want to minimize. That is, that you wouldn't want to use it all the time, so I'm not adding bleach. But wetland specific, I don't think that there's any soap chemicals or soap that's bad. Now you'll remember in the example that the owner of the Grand Lake talked about chemicals and, and they, he was talking more about uh, hazardous waste and cleaning chemicals that would have that a toxic effect on the plants. Dave, maybe you could also point out and talk a little bit about liquid soaps versus powder soaps. Um, there's always been some questions about that also. Well, when you're looking at soaps in general, uh, first off, we like to highlight that you use the right amount. 
that if you're not using the right amount of soap, you cause problems. And in Minnesota, some of the research that we found was Min Minnesotans could measure liquid detergent better than powders. <laughs> so, uh, and I think it's a, a function of ease and a function of cost. The other thing, though, that 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 comes up and and um, is something that people think about is is what do they put in as an additive? That soap is made up of soap and something uh, to be called a filler and a liquid soap. Uh, that filler is water, and we know that that doesn't cause problems with the system. So in general, that's kind of where we look at or, or walk through the soap uh, issue. Great. Now I have a question here that uh, for you, Mark, uh, talking about how we monitor standard systems and what are the results of what we're seeing coming out of standard systems, maybe in comparison with performance systems, looking at BOD and total suspended solids and fecal coliform. Uh, yes, Barbara. We really do not monitor standard systems for BOD or total suspended solids or for fecals. Uh, the reason we don't is because we have lots and lots of literature and lots and lots of research showing what the performance of a standard system is. Uh, for a septic tank, the BOD coming out of a septic tank is about 175. The total suspended solids are about 65. And the fecals are about a million fecals per 100 milliliters of solution. So we know that's what the septic tank does. Again, there's lots of research based on that, and there's also a lot of research talking about the soil and how that performs. The soil basically, after straining the sewage through three feet of soil coming from the septic tank, basically we see a total removal of BOD, a total removal of suspended solids, and basically a total removal of fecal organisms of all three of those. So we're really confident through based on lots and lots of research that started back in the 1930s, maybe even before that, that standard systems provide excellent treatment for us. Great. Thanks, Mark. We have uh, three similar questions, and they've all come in from Minnesota, so maybe we here in Minnesota are thinking ahead to winter. These all have to do with cold climates. Um, and in cold climates, I'm going to throw this one to you, Barb, because there are a couple about wetlands. In cold climates with seasonal or intermittent use of homes, is there a problem with freezing of the constructed wetlands or drain fields um, that are fed by a drip system? And uh, again, um, a concern from lakeshore owners who are concerned about whether those, those alternative systems are adaptable for just seasonal use or do they need to be winterized? Well, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, seasonal wetlands uh, and a drip system, but we do have experience with uh, wetland systems in the northern part of the state. And basically our experience with them is if they are um, adequately insulated uh, through the use of the existing plant material that's there, uh, through the addition of a mulch, either a plant mulch or um, some type of peat uh, soil mixture mulch, um, by creating an air gap in there, creating an ice layer and then dropping the water level in the wetland. Those are all ways to basically um, provide insulation for the wetland because that water does remain in the system for quite a few days and it does get rather cool in the, in the winter up here in Minnesota. Um, at Grand Lake where we saw in the, earlier in the, in the program, um, that basically is on nine homes uh, during, the, during the summer months, but in the winter months there's a lot of snowbirds. And so the, the use does drop down. And uh, although we have some freezing near the surface, the wetland system um, has not froze. At our research site at the uh, Northeast Regional Correctional Facility in Duluth, we have replicated wetland treatment systems. These are all subsurface flow where the wastewater remains below the uh, top of the rock. Um, over four years of operation, last winter was our first winter where we did have some significant freezing in one of the wetlands. Um, part of it because we dropped our flows way down um, to 40% uh, of the design. Um, we had no snow cover and we didn't do a good job of insulation. So it taught us a good lesson there in that um, in that application, we probably should have dropped the water level to get that air gap in there. So with wetland systems, there is maintenance involved, um, making sure the plants are grow growing, and also as we approach the winter to ensure that it is um, insulated properly. Okay, thanks Barb. Uh, Craig, I'm going to throw this one at you. Are the rural electric power companies involved in the management of on-site systems in Minnesota? And this uh, question came out of Morgantown, West Virginia. Well, that's an interesting question, Fred, because um, 
they are starting to get involved. Um, there have been a few um, co-ops in my area that are actually doing some management of some collection systems. And I recently attended a meeting where other co-ops across the state were looking at how they could get involved in on-site systems, collection systems, individual homeowner systems, and what kind of a role that they could play. And I think it's going to be a very interesting territory that we go to in the future with uh, rural co-ops helping uh, develop systems and management of systems in the future. Craig, could you just lay out exactly what their involvement is in the two examples or the examples that where they're doing it right now? What, when we say that they're managing, what, what is that co-op doing? Basically, they're doing the uh, routine, what we call, as you know, routine maintenance. Um, they're going out periodically checking the systems checking the tanks, uh, looking where the solid levels are, checking the pumps, uh, making sure that they're working, things of that nature that should be done on a regular basis for a system. And they uh, charge that then to the homeowners on this collection system. They're also available if there's problems, right? I mean, they, yes. they get, they're the ones that get the call. They receive some training, um, I believe through your programs that you do through yep. the state, Dave. And that, this in the videos too, it talked, uh, Bob talked about that uh, Scandia site. And that there is a, um, a sanitary district that oversees it. So it's a little different. But the thing that was important is both of those places have someone that they call if they're having problems. And I think that's, you know, that's an important piece for homeowners, at least you know, that they have that contact to, to deal with stuff. Yeah, I think it can really develop in the future. I think there's a really opportunity for uh, rural uh, electric co-ops to get involved with on-site. And it's, it's exciting. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark Westpital, I'm going to throw this one at you. Another question from Morgantown, West Virginia. Are NSF Class 1 aerobic systems approved for surface discharge? Uh, in the state of Minnesota, they are not uh, through our program here. Um, if you wanted to go to a surface discharge from an individual home, that would be allowed in the state, but you have to go through a federal permitted process. And right now, at the state level, we do not have a good regulatory scheme to permit an individual home with an individual service discharge. Uh, we do classify NSF systems that are approved through NSF as a standard uh, aerobic tank in Minnesota, but that discharge has to go to a soil treatment unit just like it would for a regular septic tank system. Okay, thanks, Mark. And uh, Barb uh, McCarthy, uh, using the wetland system in your cold climate, how much of a water quality change do you see in BOD, TSS, and nitrogen reductions from winter to summer? Do we know that? <laughs> well, I don't have it uh, all at, the, at my fingertips here, but uh, I know uh, typically in the, the wetland treatment systems that we've been um, dealing with over the last four years, we do see a reduction in performance uh, during the colder months of the year. Uh, that would be, uh, there's actually a little bit of a lag. Um, our coldest uh, effluents are typically would be in uh, January, February, and March. Um, those would be the coldest times. Those would be when our performance would decrease. Um, generally speaking, though, the wetlands can meet uh, secondary standards. Um, for uh, TSS, BOD, and, and fecals, um, except for the, the three or four months of the year where, the, where the, uh, it's really cold. So that's where we really rely on the soil dispersal component to complete that. Um, our research at Grand Lake and NERC for uh, nitrogen removal, um, during the first three uh, years, we actually had some uh, pretty good nitrogen removal rates, but we're finding uh, as uh, time goes on that that um, nitrogen uh, removal is decreasing, um, for example, at Grand Lake. Another thing that we have to look at is, is not just the concentration, but actually the, the mass removal rates. Um, in the summer, uh, mass removal rates would, would be um, approaching 70-80% uh, on some of the wetland systems, and that would, would decrease during the winter months. Barb, also there's in their packets, they got a handout on terms of the research sites, both at Lake Washington and at the NERC site. So there's some data there that they can look at. And if they have more specific questions, um, that uh, that would be they could contact us in, in yes. terms of more specific results from those research projects. 
Great, thanks. Okay, you thanks. Said, said you didn't have much at the tip of your tongue, but I think that was pretty good information. Um, I've got two, two sort of short questions for you, Dave. I'm going to give them to you both at the same time. Would antibacterial soaps harm the bacteria in a sewage treatment system? And then where does recirculating sand fl filter effluent go, and how often is it recirculated? Um, those are two short questions, but different applications. <laughs> That's right. Very um, different. So the first one, uh, antibacterial soaps. Um, my my short answer is it's going to have some impact, and it, it's a function of how much antibacterial soap in terms of how much of an impact. Uh, there are contractors working here in Minnesota that that it's a major concern, and they've run into situations and and tied it back to a lot of antibacterial soap use as a, a piece of the problem in terms of a failing system. Um, normal use at one or two sinks is probably not a big deal. Lots of use uh, would fall into the problem, uh, would fall into a problem category. Uh, now jumping to recirculating uh, sand filters, um, our designs, we're looking at recirculating five times the straight, the forward flow. So for example, the, the home that we looked at uh, used about 400 gallons a day. We designed the sand filter then at a loading rate of 2,000, bringing that 400 gallons back through that system five times. So that's kind of our loading rates that we're looking at. Okay, and where does that effluent go when it leaves the sand filter? Um, where does it go? It goes into a soil dispersal uh, system, and uh, the example that we had on the video at Lionel Lakes, they had a, approximately 18 inches of soil that it goes into. Um, the, the thing that, that was interesting, and, and we probably didn't talk about it that much in Lionel Lakes, is that that system was also failing to the surface, mm -hmm. and the, the pretreatment device has retrofitted that, so, so now that system is operating again uh, subsurface the way it's supposed to. So the, the pretreated effluent has made that system return to its, it, the mode of operation that, that it was designed for. Right. So those performance systems include the pretreatment unit and the soil dispersal system. Yeah, and, and I think that's, a, that's an important part. Um, as we look forward in terms of the stuff that we're talking about, subsurface disposal gives you a little bit of, of extra risk protection because mm -hmm. you're not, you don't have that uh, potential direct connection. And so, you know, uh, the question was asked earlier of Mark, do we allow surface disposal uh, of, yes, of treated discharge of treated effluent? And the answer is not in this program, in a different program. And, and uh, personally, I like keeping it in the ground because it, I think there's some advantages that way. Great. Craig, here's a question for you for a local, our local government representative um, from Pequot Lakes. Do counties set their own schedules for, freeze, for fees and permit? <laughs> Not often for free, Not I know, for freeze, but I for fees that. and permits. Uh, yes, they do, throughout, in Minnesota anyway. They set their own fees um, based on their own budgets. Um, in Cass County, which I'm more familiar with, um, we set fees for homeowners, we set commercial fees, uh, the commercial fees are based on flows, and then we also set fees for uh, community systems that are based on both the number of homes and the flow of the system. Uh, a new thing to Cass County that we are looking at is uh, operating permits. Uh, we now require operating permits for commercial establishments, and we do require a renewal fee on the operating permits. I think that's a great comment that the performance and some of the commercial establishments are going to need a little bit more uh, county and regulatory involvement. So you need to have a different fee structure for those so that, so that, that cost is, is real, realized and it doesn't become a burden. Because I can see uh, local units of government just getting burnt out by some of these management mm -hmm. things and so that those, the, some of those extra fees should help with staffing and some of those issues. And it goes back to, Dave, that there were, all we talked about tonight, management. And the county's not there looking to be the big hammer that they got to get this permit and get this permit again, but we're there to try to act as consultants to help them to get the most life out of the systems that they're putting in the ground. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've got two questions here now from Indiana, and the first one I'm pretty sure is a ringer. Uh, it's from West something, and it says, do you think your gophers have a chance against our Boilermakers on Saturday? Uh, the second one uh, also comes from Indiana, and Mark, I would uh, address this one to you. 
Uh, this is community systems. Uh, in the time during which they're planning them, uh, as to how they deal with the problem, uh, what do they do in that, in that interim period uh, if they've got a serious problem? <laughs> okay, currently now, for, if we are uh, planning with a city, currently we do not really take any enforcement action against that city while they're in the planning process. Um, if they are somewhat reluctant to uh, do the planning process, we may use some enforcement action against them. I don't think we ever have done any enforcement action against a small community with a bad discharge in the past. And because basically most of the times the communities recognize their problems, they know it's a problem having this uh, untreated sewage out on the ground surface going to a, a stream or a lake. And so when we approach them about the problem, they usually have been fairly cooperative in, in fixing the problem, so we do not give them any sort of interim limits or anything of that nature, we just kind of work with them and the service discharge allows to be continued until that uh, system is online. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next one is from Carthage, Missouri and it says, how large are the mound systems being used in Minnesota, specifically for single family homes? And Dave, you... Take when we look at mound design or sizing, there's two pieces. The, the rock bed is, a, is sized based on the flow from the house. So for a typical three bedroom house, the rock bed for a mound is 10 by 40. The footprint then is the rock bed and the area I need for it to soak in. So depending on the soil at the site, that's going to be uh, more or less. If I'm on a heavy clay soil, that absorption area for a 10 foot wide rock bed is 50 feet. So that I end up with a relatively large footprint for a different soil, you know, uh, uh, more coarse soil, a sandy loam or a sand, that absorption area becomes less. The thing that I like to comment to people though is that if I'm not careful, it can become ugly looking. And so that one of the things that we're looking at now is, you know, part of <coughs> the mound is also to landscape it in and landscaping to avoid water standing behind it, landscaping just so that it's not so bad. In the video that uh, we were watching, we saw a nice flower garden. That was actually a landscape mound system. So uh, some of the sizing is going to relate to the site and those kind of things. But the thing I wanted to highlight is two pieces, the rock bed for the flow, the absorption area for the soil that you're dealing with. Okay, now I've got uh, several here that deal with costs in some way. Uh, Pequot Lakes, uh, more discussion about system costs, maintenance costs, monitoring costs. And I don't know if they're referring to one of the uh, handouts. Here's another one from Des Moines, cost, O&M cost. Does O&M include debt service costs? Let me deal with that one right up front. And in our handout, the O&M does not include any debt, debt service stuff. That the, our estimated O&M costs were for taking care of it, which included um, uh, monitoring, and that would include uh, maybe sampling or at least visiting the site. So we added costs for that, and then pumping costs. The other thing, I mean, just kind of a comment on costs is, it's, costs are very A, site specific. Um, we were involved in a system here in Minnesota where it was extremely expensive because they were going to do some um, uh, tunneling through bedrock. So that's going to increase the cost. Uh, the, other th the other part of cost is that you know labor costs are going to be different, material costs are going to be different. I know uh, up in Duluth it can become extremely expensive for hauling materials. So what happens then is, is that a material um, a high user of material system isn't the best choice, and so that some of these other alternatives jump up as a, as a choice that because of material availability. So cost is, is really specific to the area, at least the capital, the construction cost. And in, in addition to that, I'd just like to add that uh, costs also may be in how much the homeowners or the owners of the system want to become involved. Uh, some of the systems that I work with, it's, it's different. Um, the one showed tonight, Shingabee Island, the homeowners do a great job of going out and looking at that system. They are really involved in that system. They monitor it on a regular basis. Um, whereas some other systems that I have uh, or deal with um, have hired outside consultants to look at them. One has hired a um, cooperative talked about. And uh, another system going in that was shown tonight was uh, North 10 Mile. They are going out for bids and looking for a professional maintenance company to do their maintenance. So obviously, again, it's going to be, that'll affect the level of cost. Okay, when you're talking about uh, some outside uh, 
firm dealing with these costs. I, I think that relates very well to this series of questions on here, okay? Of these systems that require ongoing maintenance, how does the homeowner pay that cost? Quarterly, biannually, annually, if an outside firm is doing it. What's the range of cost for maintenance on some of these systems, standard or alternative? And the last one is, what is the homeowner's view on these costs, positive or negative? Well, every homeowner's excited to spend <laughs> lots of money on sewage. I mean, <laughs> but I, I keep do, us let, me yeah. Do, yeah, let me just say the, the one thing, I mean, to put it in perspective, of a standard system that we're talking about a pumping uh, 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 regiment of once every three years, that, that we're talking about in Minnesota a typical investment of between a hundred and a hundred and fifty dollars for that for that maintenance. So if we go no, for the three years of, the, of, that, of that management cycle. So if you divide that out, that's a $50 investment a year. It's typically paid every three years when you have that, that system pumped. I think that the, the electrical things, they're actually doing the costs at a, on a monthly. I mean, that you yep. pay a, that's a monthly doing. charge. Um, Chingabee Island, they do it on a quarterly charge. Um, it was a good question before brought out about capital costs and recovering those. Um, that also needs to be figured into those costs as far as the homeowners when they're going to pay that final bill. Um, and again, that's done, she can be honest, quarterly. Um, Ten Mile Lake, they're looking at, um, because they dealt with the township and the county, they're looking at it doing semi-annually um, through their taxes. So they will be paying that uh, to the county. Great. Barb, here's a three wetland questions for you, all sort of related. Um, one from Douglas County here in Minnesota, information on how to build a constructed wetland. And um, one from Warwick City, Indiana, are we familiar with the living wetlands that NASA did research on? And if not, have we done similar research on living wetlands compared to the rock boat base? And what's your opinion about those? And then here's a little more specific one to add in there about how well do the wetlands clean the effluent and remove heavy metals? Okay, the answer to the third question, um, we haven't done any, uh, the, the systems that we've been involved with, we haven't done any, uh, any tests looking at heavy metal removal. So I really can't answer that. I know that they've been using uh, wetlands for uh, landfill leachate um, somewhere in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities area, and so I think that there is some information on that. And the, uh, what was the first question? Um, uh, what are, how are wetlands constructed? Oh, a general description of wetland construction? Okay. Um, the actual assembly process would include uh, uh, providing an excavation, an area uh, for uh, a basin basically similar to a, a a pond system with a fairly flat bottom and uh, three to one side slope so they're not too steep. Uh, getting that fairly level and smooth, putting an impermeable liner down, um, having a pipe that would convey wastewater into the wetland from a septic tank that would be septic tank effluent. Typically it's a, a force main that would be directed into the wetland with a header pipe across it to spread the wastewater across the, uh, the wetland at the, at the beginning of it. Um, there is also a pipe put at the end of the wetland to take that water out of the wetland to your soil dispersal um, system. It's filled with pea rock, 18 inches of pea rock is our typical uh, construction. We then planted the plants. Uh, we've used cat cattails, bulrushes, and reeds. Um, I know other folks in Minnesota have tried aeration systems in as a um, way to uh, bring oxygen into the system uh, during the colder months of the year. There are all other, other wetlands where they've actually put more of a, a soil component at the top of, uh, at the top of the wetland, and that would basically complete the, uh, the wetland system. Um, I'm actually not the wetland specialist at NRI. Uh, there's another group uh, working on it, um, so I don't have a lot of knowledge about the, the NASA system, so. Great, thanks, Barb. Mark, here's one for you. Do the state shoreline regulations require two sites for all lots, and is that wave for collector, collector or centralized systems? Okay, the requirement uh, is not just in shoreland, the requirement is statewide. The state rules governing septic systems indicate, or specify I should say, that all sites uh, platted uh, now 
today would have to require two uh, sites for individual sewage treatment systems and we're also going to require that those sites could support a standard system. Uh, they don't have to put in the standard system first, but uh, the rules require that the soil quality be well enough that at least you can put in a, a two standard systems if you know things should go wrong with your alternative or experimental uh, type system. And what was the second part of that question there, Barb? Uh, is, that, uh, is that requirement for two sites waived? for when they have a collector or centralized system? Yeah, if they're going to go directly to a centralized system, then uh, basically you do not need to have that two-site requirement. That if you're going to design a subdivision to go with a collector system or go to sewer or something of that nature, that two-site requirement would be waived. Craig, here's one for you. This is the question, one of those money questions <laughs> um, that we knew would come. Have, uh, has any funding been established for ISTS or retrofitting existing systems and one from Iowa about, can you explain anything about the various grants or other funding programs available? So you may not know specifically in Iowa, but you might have a, a sense from a local perspective. Yes, there, there are, is a lot of funding agencies out there. And I think we could have a whole two hour session on just funding and trying to obtain funding. Um, some of the funding that I have used in Minnesota is um, through the Public Facilities Authority through the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, I've used some funding that has been obtained through EPA. I've used some funding that's been um, filtered down through HUD, through the Department of Trade and Economic Development. Um, again, it's, you've just got to go out there and be aggressive and try to find all the sources of funding. Great. And here's a, a question uh, asking for clarification. Uh, maybe, okay. Barb, you can explain this. On the system that Bob Mostad described in Osakis, um, how was the soil treatment accomplished? They thought that it seemed like it was just added on to where there was a failed drain field. Could you explain that more? Well, I think with that system, the way I understood, although I wasn't directly involved with it, it's an aerobic treatment tank um, followed by a drip system that was installed. So um, the aerobic treatment tank would provide a certain level of treatment. Many of the systems uh, go through a testing program um, and they're uh, certified for removing uh, BOD and TSS. And I believe that the system that they used in that application would be considered like a class one um, effluent. And uh, typically with that type of system, you might see 30-30 uh, or somewhere in that range for BOD, TSS, and you get a significant fecal reduction. You'll probably still have uh, several thousand fecals left uh, or, or less. And so your uh, final treatment then occurs in the soil. It's distributed through a drip system um, where you apply a fairly small amount of wastewater to the soil. It's dosed into the soil, so it's dosed um, and you, uh, it provides for um, aeration of the soil um, after it's uh, dosed, and, dosed and rested for some period of time. Okay, next we've got uh, some questions regarding mound systems and problems or failure problems with mound systems. Why do they fail? Uh, what can be done to prevent them failing? What's done to fix them? Uh, are alternatives the answer? Uh, that whole range. Dave, would you... When, uh, when you look at mound systems and their failures, they typically break into two big things. One is a mistake in terms of design. And so we talked about all systems that we need to do good site evaluation to deal with it. The other problem is typically construction materials. So I need to choose the right materials. Um, so good design, good construction are the keys to making them work. Can we fix them? In certain cases, yes. Are alternatives the answer? I say do stuff right the first time, then you don't have to worry about alternatives. <laughs> uh, but, but that may be a, a piece of the answer in certain places. If I could add to that, Dave, a little bit. That I, uh, they, I go out and talk to a lot of county planning and zoning administrators, and I ask them specifically, what is your failure rate on mound systems? And the numbers I consistently get back from the planning and zoning people is a failure, a failure rate between 1% and 3% for mound systems. And Dave and I have been out on a number of those failed mounds that have broke, and we find, again, it's, a, it's basically a materials problem, a construction problem, or sometimes it's a siting problem. Where it's basically on really, really poor soils. But actually, our success rate on mounds is very, very high. Great. Well, we had a lot of good questions tonight. We didn't get through quite all of them, but we tried to get to many around Minnesota and, and from other states. Uh, we want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. 
And again, we want to ask you to fill out your evaluation forms or as evaluation for each participant at the site, as well as one form for the coordinator to fill out. There was also some information in your packets about additional materials that you could order. There are fact sheets and there's a homeowner's manual. Uh, one of the questions we didn't get to was how often should your tank be pumped? And this manual will help you figure that out for your site. So you can order those that, with information that's in the packet. Uh, also, if you want to get those continuing education credits, you need to get registered with your site coordinator. Fred. Okay, and I'd say thanks again to the planning committee, all of the experts who joined us live here in the studio, the folks who allowed us to film uh, their properties and or interview them on camera, and to all of you out there who served as site coordinators. Special thanks to Cindy Mossberg who coordinated the sign-ups and mailing, to Sherry Hayes who did the filming and editing, and Ken Olson who did the entire effort. Good evening and have a great day tomorrow. <laughs>